Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jennifer Patterson Tui of The Verge is here, and she brings the creepy Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics uh, to the table. We talk about its very bendable nature, but also about what we see as the future of the smart home when it comes to robotics. Then, my story of the week is all about how Microsoft's AI Copilot is rather popular, it seems, among developers. Uh, both Jennifer and I discuss how it should be used as a tool and used responsibly and not as a means to take over the world. After that, my first interview is with Engadget's own Carissa Bell, who joins us to talk about a new app from TikTok that's set its sights on Instagram. Afterwards, Lisa Edichico of CNET stops by to finally, finally give me the answer I have been asking for a while. What in the heck is a super app? All of that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly with Jennifer Patterson Tui and Micah Sargent. Episode 333, recorded Thursday, April 18th, 2024. Boston Dynamics, Bendy Robot. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am your host, Micah Sargent, and I am joined across the internet by Jennifer Patterson Tui of The Verge. Welcome back to the show, Jen. Hi, Micah. Happy to be back. Happy it's, to uh, have you. It's been a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Months, yes. such oh. a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this works. I, I can always count on getting to see you again. And uh, <laughs> it's that means that it's time for our stories of the week. Tell us uh, what came across your line of sight this week. Sure. Yeah. So um, I was slightly terrified this week, so I thought that might be worth talking about. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I don't. This actually happened a few days ago. So, um, but the Boston Dynamics uh, Robotics Company released its new humanoid robot, and it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If we, okay, watch this because it's like look. It looks like a dead. It's laying Human on the ground. On the yeah, it's. And then, it's oh a, my god! What? Its <laughs> what legs it bend up toward its torso, <laughs> and then suddenly it's like you know you thought I was laying one way. I'm actually laying the other oh, way. Let me just I turn know. my <laughs> legs and arms around, and my face, which is just a selfie ring light. Oh, <laughs> that's what it looks like. Yes. No, and you know this is uh, all jokes aside. This is is really quite an impressive machine, um, and as a smart home reviewer, I actually have spent a lot of time with robots and robot type devices in my home and always really kind of keeping an eye on the robotic space. And this is a real step forward kind of in the humanoid robotic form. Um, it, Atlas is, so the story here is that uh, Boston Dy Dynamics um, was retired its original Atlas robot, which is the one that was you were just showing there, um, which was a much more robot-like humanoid robot. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't look sort of like someone that you might want to hang out with. Whereas <laughs> the new, and that was a hydraulic robot, whereas this Atlas is an all new electric version of this humanoid robot. And it really does have very sort of strong humanoid characteristics. Um, the, the really amusingly, Boston Dynamics tweeted, no, it's not someone in a suit <laughs> as a, a shade there <laughs> to the other more recent uh, humanoid robot that Tesla showed off, um, which was a person in a suit. But this this is a real kind of leap forward. Um, and it's interesting from you know, commercial use it's designed they're actually the part the first partnership is with Hyundai. Hi uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Hyundai. <laughs> um, yeah. Hyundai. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually owns Boston Dynamics, but there, um, so the idea is eventually the robot, and this will take many years, can work on the factory floor doing sort of the more dangerous work, maybe the more repetitive work that humans can't do. But where I found this interesting slash scary um, is this is sort of the first time I've seen a robot that looks like the kind of Rosie the robot of the Jetsons kind of yes. dream I've always had of having a smart home assistant. And it's also made me realize that perhaps I don't want that after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, there was so, yeah, there was something charming about Rosie. And maybe yeah. it was the fact that 
we're looking at an animation and that helps keep it in this fake kind of realm. And I also just pictured almost like taking an auric vacuum cleaner and putting it, you know, putting a, a wheel on it and it, you know, talks very robotic. It just, it feels separated yeah. enough from humanity. And then I think at the time, maybe we didn't have as much scary uh, instance, right? We didn't have as much scary right. we hadn't kind of had horror about The Terminator robots. hadn't yeah. come out. Terminator <laughs> and iRobot and some of the others yeah. were not there yet to make us go, ooh, I've got second thoughts about all of this. Because I don't know, yeah. I, I, I think that... There's definitely a part of me that loves the idea of not having to do my laundry anymore. <laughs> I think that would be fantastic. Even even if it just folded my laundry for me, that's really all I want. And, you know, we've had the promise of laundry robots in the past that never come true. Uh, the folding robot at the C at yeah, CES, CES I've seen every three or four times. Year and it yeah, never is real. Your clothes. <laughs> is that also a person wearing a laundry folding robot? Yeah. Uh, so I I love that idea, but do you think that, look, depending on who you talk to, um, a, a true self-driving car, the sort of um, fully autonomous, truly fully autonomous can drive anywhere a uh, self-driving car is so far in the future that we won't ever see it, depending on who you talk to. That's that's the, the belief. Um, yeah. When we talk about... AI and where it's headed, maybe that's a little bit more graspable. When we talk about AR and VR and how uh, far we are from just being able to put on some glasses, that's pretty far in the future. How far away do you think it is for us to have a rosy robot in our homes? Is that is that closer rather than further away? Or is all of this still kind of military applications and uh, bomb diffusing applications and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I think we are actually closer than we have been in a long time. Um, as I said, I've tested robots in my home that are similar in concept, like the Amazon Astro, although it doesn't have arms. Um, there are, and we already have a lot of robots in our homes. But I think where I'm kind of coming to is that we probably don't need a butler. We don't need this multi-purpose humanoid robot walking around our house, doing things for us, unloading the dishwasher for us, folding our clothes. What we probably do need and what's much more likely to come and what we already have to some extent are individual robots that help with tasks. Mm. Um, so we already have robot vacuums and robot mops. I have two robot lawnmowers going around my garden right now that I'm <laughs> testing. Um, they're not- I want to visit your but, place. Like, <laughs> I, I just really want to see everything because it's got to be like Willy Wonka there. <laughs> it sounds incredible. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Slightly dystopian. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but yes, you know, and- I think it's an interesting goal to have the Rose of the Robot. And I think there are a lot of manufacturers and researchers that sort of trying to achieve this. And the big thing here, obviously, is the mobility. And this is what this Atlas robot does that we really haven't seen before is that very fluid, natural humanoid movements. And um, actually the news, you know, what Boston Dynamics was touting is that it can do so much more movement than a human hence the the weird yogi poses yeah i've never like met a person going who could do the wrong all way <laughs> and i've seen some really impressive yeah. moves on instagram from different yogis but nothing yeah. to that level <laughs> but you know whether we need that type of technology in our homes i can see obviously great use cases in commercial and military space um i'm sure having you know especially rescue i think robots are a really interesting space for sort of disaster relief and recovery um but in our homes i think the future probably is more robotics in more places in our home um, rather than one single robot that will roam around and do everything for us. Um, but I think it's a good goal, like it's a good sort of North Star right. to kind of help us innovate interesting areas. I mean, we have a robot that washes our dishes already, right? We have a robot that cleans our clothes already. We do need that next step of something to take the dishes out of the dishwasher and put them away. Um, and, you know, but maybe that doesn't need to be a, a six foot tall humanoid robot in our kitchen. Maybe we can, someone can come up with a better solution. Yeah. Let that. <laughs> it's not going to cost so much either. Let that robot 
go make some money break dancing and we yeah. will <laughs> we will keep doing our, our dishes. Um I yeah, overall I, I think I, I agree with you. You know, I want to compare it to AI a little bit because we've seen uh, for the most part, as generative AI has taken off, we have seen this general purpose generative AI kind of reaching uh, this level of Im like it's impressive what it can do. You can generate images with it. You can generate music in some cases. You can generate uh, just text just in, in conversations and asking you questions. But more and more, the terms that I keep hearing are agents, uh, Gen AI agents, Gen AI agents. And it's this idea that instead of having a single multi-purpose AI, that you have very specific focused AI tasks and you kind of ask the question and it goes to the right thing. I think we kind of see that, you know, you, you mentioned this is kind of a North Star, uh, but yeah, the idea that not every task that you're doing, it's much simpler, I think, and much more easy to grok, yes, if we have uh, robots that are specifically tuned for each individual task and can be trained on doing that. But uh, I recently saw a video of a robotic arm that uh, I think it was, it may have even been at San Francisco's, uh, at the San Francisco airport. And it is a coffee shop and you go up and you place your order and the robot makes your coffee. The time that it takes the robot to make the coffee <laughs> yeah. compared, compared to the compared human to being human. <laughs> is so much longer that the line was very long. They were in it for the novelty. But after that, it's like, I just need my coffee because my plane's about to board. Yeah. Uh, how... I, so there, there are a couple of things where, you know, people then kind of ask questions. What's the reason for this? Why do we need this? And I think one place that we as tech people sometimes, something that we we may kind of fail to see is uh, one aspect of this is, of course, accessibility and uh, mm. just frankly, inclusivity in general. There are tasks that we as able-bodied people can perform that other people uh, struggle to perform on their own, maybe in some cases need the help of others to be able to perform. The idea that they could live a uh, more, you know, normal, so to speak, life. Independent. Uh, yeah, an independent and average existence is fantastic. But I also think that, you know, there, there's uh, been a study or maybe even a couple of studies about the productivity of human beings. And we kind of have this idealized, uh, some of us have this idealized belief that people from years ago were far more uh, hardworking and productive and this and that than we are because they went and worked in the fields and toiled away. But when you look at what a human of today is able to achieve in a day and all of the different things that we're able to achieve, it is vastly more productive and vastly more impactful than the person who toiled in the fields. And so think about the person who, on top of everything that they have to get done in a day, is also going around and vacuuming their floors and mowing their lawn and doing this. And if they could you know, delegate that task to someone else to get more of the stuff that they need to get done. I think that that's a positive. And I, I think the idea that, you know, a human being just wants to, to be lazy and push off tasks uh, to someone else Maybe that could apply to me, <laughs> but I don't think that applies. <laughs> no, but that's to the whole generally. argument for the smart home there too. I think you're right. It's like it's giving us the it's giving us time by taking mundane and boring tasks off our hands to do the more interesting, innovative, fun, spend. You know that I think that's a real value, and I think mm -hmm. that's where robotics is really important and could, you know, eventually have a really important role in our homes. Um, I think there's also two sides to the robotics and this kind of goes to my first comment about this being scary. Um, there's a real push to try and make robots feel kind of warm and cuddly and like have personalities. And I don't necessarily think that's a good thing either. And I kind of like this individual, as you mentioned, like the agents, individual robots, individual AI, because if it all comes together, it's much more likely to raise up 
and take over the world. Whereas if we keep it separate, <laughs> then it can't. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, in all seriousness, I think it also becomes more productive and more useful for us. And when things go wrong, you only lose the function of one element, like my robot vacuum's broken, doesn't mean that my dishwasher now That's doesn't work and that my washing machine now doesn't work. Whereas if you have this single humanoid robot that does everything in your house and when it breaks down or a firmware update goes bad, <laughs> nothing works anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting in that the, humani the humanization, I think, is this the kind of the real kind of conflict when it comes to robotics, like tr trying to make robots appeal to us on an emotional level as opposed to a practical and useful level, I find is a bit of a fine line that I think it's too many companies maybe are, are going the opposite direction. Although there's a huge amount of benefit in like, um, I know there's been a lot of evidence and studies done around loneliness mm -hmm. and how AI and there are some great, there's an interesting robot, um, uh, LEQ, which has been used as a study. Um, there was a study in New York to combat loneliness in seniors living alone and they use this little AI robot and it's got a cute face and it talks to them and it has um it's proactive so it talks to them as opposed to having with something like Amazon's Alexa you need to talk to it mm -hmm. um so there you know that but again I think that's a different sector and I think it's an interesting sector but from from what I'm interested in here is the practical side of robotics. Um, and I think I don't need a smiley face or a, a <laughs> ring light <laughs> right. on my six foot robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, we can, uh, dispense with the, the kind of silly aspects of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is a, a great story of the week and I'm really glad that you, you brought it to the table today. Uh, so we could all have a chill and a thrill to get through, uh, that story. Let's take a quick break though, before we come back with more, uh, I do want to tell you about our our sponsor, new on the show this week, it's Yahoo Finance, who's bringing you this episode of Tech News Weekly. You know Yahoo, and you may know about Yahoo Finance. You know, when you think about it, perhaps you're someone who's being very, uh, very careful about your financial future. You're trying to make sure, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've got things figured out. I've saved money. I've done some research. I've uh, worked with investments. But now's perhaps the time where you want to be more proactive and you want to kind of dig in. Well, that is where Yahoo Finance can come into play because every financial great has used this tool for over 25 years. So if you are new to investing, if you've been investing for years, Yahoo Finance, that's the tool uh, that you need. And we're, we're looking through the Yahoo Finance site right now, and what you'll find are loads of different stories about the different stocks uh, that you may be investing in. You can see easily, you can look up ticker symbols and learn more about it. It's all right there on one page, and I think that's kind of what, what makes this such a great tool for people, is being able to kind of quickly see and understand what's going on, know the news stories, and also see the most important uh, markets right at your disposal. Um, you can easily by the way, link your brokerage accounts securely so that you kind of have that unified view. That's why I was just kind of talking about this sort of uh, one dashboard view of your wealth, including your 401k and other investments. And you get a comprehensive perspective that distinguishes great investors. Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to examine your wealth in its entirety. It's really nice going to uh, the Yahoo Finance page and, you know, I can just type something in real quick and learn about it. It's not just the symbols. So if you don't know those ticker symbols, you can just type in the name of a company. So I'm able to do that and do a quick search and learn all the financial news about it. It's the one place to go for everything with a community of more than 90 million users every month. The real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. So for comprehensive financial news and analysis, just visit the brand behind every great investor. That's yahoofinance.com. Uh, yahoofinance.com is the website where you can go to just have that full picture of your portfolio, but also what's going on in the financial world. yahoofinance.com. All right, we are back from the break, and that means it's time for my story of the week. Uh, I wanted to talk about, would you believe it, AI. So 
Uh, there's a recent story in Bloomberg all about how Microsoft's tool called Copilot uh, is kind of, you may know, you may not know, but it's 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 taking its place in the coding and the developer in the uh, the you know computer technology industry for software developers all around uh, people have been using Microsoft copilot and the coding assistant that comes along with it uh, to help with the creation of and the update to and the you know um, adjustments, to the code bases that they're working on. Uh, early in this piece from Bloomberg, there is a developer who is quoted as saying, instead of using 15 keystrokes, it took three. It was a nice little speed boost. And it's it's interesting to me how, how much everything that we uh, see in technology, everything that is announced in technology when it comes to uh, particularly Gen AI, it's all about performance, right? It's about how large the databases are, how much has gone into training, uh, how fast it works, how many processors uh, are involved kind of in the, the server farm somewhere, and in this case, how much time it saves. And that is the way of things. You know, productivity is kind of a, a the big word when it comes to developers. But I do find it interesting that developers, I think, are some of the first to really narrow in on the uh, the true the the true understanding of what gen ai can be which is a tool that a human uses to kind of augment whatever it is they're working on you know while other industries and other places may be going it's going to take our jobs it's going to ruin everything we're seeing developers who are going oh look i can you know ask this thing and have it help and when i when i've talked to developers in the past the number of times a developer has told me that one of the main things that a developer does is Google uh, a solution to a problem, this is kind of just speeding that process up, right? You are seeing what developers from before have done to help uh, figure out you know, the, the bug that they keep running into. I keep having this, uh, I don't know, memory error and they go and they look it up and there's, um, a stack exchange message that explains what the person did with their code. This kind of just speeds that up and makes it a little bit easier because of course this code, this, this, uh, tool is trained on a bunch of instances of, of code that have existed. Now, Microsoft, of course, um, is using, in a big way, the tools from OpenAI and its, um, its GPT-4 technology as the kind of uh, backbone and behind-the-scenes tool for GitHub Copilot, uh, which, of course, is part of, of GitHub itself. But it is, it is kind of purpose- Built. Again, we talked to earlier earlier about sort of agents, and this is a tool that is specific to the coding. Um, a recent survey from Stack Overflow uh, looked at what developers are using whenever it comes to using AI coding tools, and an overwhelming number of the people who are using AI coding tools are using GitHub Copilot as their tool. 54.8% of those who responded are using GitHub Copilot. Um, it is very impressive, I think, the number of folks who are making use of this tool, but also just kind of how, again, I think what, what I find most interesting is how quickly developers just kind of locked in and said, look, this is something we can use to help us. And we're good with that, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because it is, it's essentially a robot helping you do your work, which yeah. is the same conversation we just had. True. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that perspective because really that is, you know, that's what generative AI is doing um, is helping our daily lives easier. There are a fair number of 
large caveats that are outlined in this article, specifically the number of times they say we have to like double check the work, <laughs> um, which, you know, I think is a very well known um, issue right now with generative AI, um, but, you know, the hallucinations and, and just claiming things are the way they are when they're, in fact they're not. And one of the things that this is probably space cadetti, but it's sort of always noodled me. And I've heard a few people talk about this. Generative AI is trained on things that have already been done, right? That's like we've talked, you were talking about the coding, coders Google to see how other people have solved problems. Mm -hmm. um, once we all start relying on generative AI to solve these problems for us or to create art for us or to write our articles for us, eventually we're setting up the future to not have anything to train the models on yeah, <laughs> because true. it will all have been its own work. Um, but that's, you know, that's, part, that's, that, that's a, a problem for the future. Uh, but I, 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 there's just a lot of red flags, I think here, mm -hmm. um, that are, are raised in the way that you need to use the tool responsibly. Mm -hmm. And I think when this tool is used responsibly, as many of these, uh, the people quoted in the article say, you know, we use this and it helps save me time, which means I can then focus on more important things. And ultimately we will end up hopefully producing better work. Um, but when the tool becomes your main way of yes. conducting your work, then that's where you're going to end up running into into issues. And there was an interesting quote in there where one of them, one of the programmers says, well, that's not going to be a problem because we'll self-correct. Like we self-monitor as a group. Um, the group will say, no, 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 that's wrong. We, you know, but if we're always, if you're relying on other people yes. to make sure you're doing your work it, properly, it, I feel uh, like maybe running. Sorry, I was just going to say, isn't it Douglas Adams who, uh, in, his wonderful work talks about it's sort of almost a, a, a field called the the other person's problem field or something along those lines where it's this idea <laughs> that if if everybody and everybody does everybody thinks that oh that's somebody else's problem someone that's else's, somebody else's problem. problem yeah, yeah. <laughs> then no one is actually and you're you're absolutely right I I want to give a little credit to developers because that is you know especially among open source developers they do uh, that, that that's the community what, that's can what be yeah, yeah really good about it in fact that's how they Vibrant recently community. found that <laughs> linux um or not linux but that the, it was a linux person who found the uh horrible backdoor in uh what was it ssh i think um anyway it was a, a horrible backdoor that had been placed by a bad actor as it were and yeah. it that was a self-correcting thing so there's a little bit more hope that that's the case but you're right that if everybody is constantly relying on that that's not necessarily <laughs> well no it's not even a necessary thing necessarily thing it's absolutely the case that yeah that's going to get missed and that is uh, your your point about using it as a tool and not as kind of um, just handing over a bunch of what you do. Over time, in my own use of of ChatGPT and the other tools, uh, Claude and whatnot, I have found myself shifting towards being very mindful of that, saying, "Yeah, okay, here's a problem that maybe before I would have asked chat GPT, but I, I don't trust it to be able to do what I need it to do. So I'm just going to do this, my, this thing I'm going to do myself or most of it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it is interesting and how we kind of are, are learning that. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I think, and of, of every group, of any group out there that's going to, that's using chat GPT, generative AI to help with their work, coders and programmers are the ones who are going to be, you know, amongst the most responsible users you would, you know, because they, they understand the space that they're working in so much more than many people, you know, who are beginning, like my husband started using chat GPT to help him with spreadsheets. Like he didn't even know how to use spreadsheets a couple of years ago. So <laughs> it's like, I'm worried, <laughs> but you know, one of the things I'm the, the really took the big takeaway that I, I had from this article actually was the quote at the end from um, NVIDIA. And I had actually just had a conversation with a quite well-known programmer two days ago about this. You know, what's so interesting here is that AI is making it possible to code in plain English. It is so much easier to, cro to code and to create things than it ever was before. You had to learn these languages. You had to learn how to do all of this. And now it's opening this fascinating world for 
everyone yeah. to enter into. And just, you know, to bring it back round to the smart home, um, which I love to do, um, it's really going to be hugely useful in the smart home for programming our homes to work the way we want to without relying on big corporations and organizations to come up with good solutions for our homes. We can, you know, generative AI, I think, is going to have a really interesting role in helping the smart home become a much easier place to live in and manage um, when you want to start doing complicated automations, which right now do actually require some basic programming knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, Google has its script, um, home script you can go use to sort of, and it, and it has a generative AI tool to help you just type in what you want, but still you're doing basic programming. And I'm, I'm really excited as someone who has not learned how to code <laughs> um, about how much easier um, AI is making it for everyone to kind of use this powerful tool and and uh, create some hopefully interesting things. <laughs> ah, yes, I love that idea. On on Tuesdays, if it's raining outside and the <laughs> chickens are hungry, please make sure to do this. Would be super right. super cool. So uh, much easier to do it that way. <laughs> absolutely, Jennifer Patterson Tui. Always a pleasure to have you join us here on the show. Thank you so much for your time. If folks want to keep up with what you're doing, where should they go to do that? Um, yep, happy to be here. Always a pleasure chatting. Um, most of my work can be found at theverge.com. Uh, you can also follow me on the threads at Smart Home Mama, um, also on TikTok and on X at JP2E. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks. All righty, folks. We're going to take a quick break before we come back with our first interview of this episode of Tech News Weekly. I do want to tell you about our sponsor. It's Cashfly who are bringing you this episode. You certainly have heard about Cashfly for more than 20 years now. Cashfly has held a track record for high performing, ultra reliable content delivery, serving more than 5,000 companies in more than 80 countries. And here at Twit, we have been using Cashfly for more than a decade. We love the lag-free video loading, the hyper-fast downloads, and the friction-free site interactions. And I'm sure all of you do too, anytime you've interacted with what we do here and it gets to you as quick as it does. Well, that's because of Cashfly. Cashfly is the only CDN built for throughput. It's ultra low latency video streaming delivers video to more than a million concurrent users. It's got lightning fast gaming that delivers downloads faster with zero lag, glitches, or outages. Mobile content optimization offers automatic and simple image optimization so your site loads faster on any device. And flexible month-to-month -month billing for as long as needed with discounts for fixed terms. So that way you can design your contract when you switch to Cashfly. Cashfly delivers rich media content up to 158% faster than other major CDNs and allows you to shield your site content in their cloud, ensuring a 100% cash hit ratio. And with Cashfly's elite managed packages, you're going to get that VIP treatment. Your dedicated account manager will be with you from day one, ensuring a smooth implementation and reliable 24-7 support when you need it. So learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com dot com slash twit. That's C A C H E F L Y dot com slash twit. And we thank Cashfly for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All righty, folks, we are back from the break, and that means it's time for our first interview. This one about a little something something that TikTok is working on. Just to talk about it is Engadget's own Carissa Bell. Welcome back to the show, Carissa. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So let's talk about TikTok's latest experiment called TikTok Notes. What is it and how does it work? So it's a brand new app from TikTok and it kind of looks a lot like Instagram. It's a photo sharing app. Um, you know, you can share multiple photos at once in a feed. There's a algorithmic feed, a following feed. You know, it's a little bit of TikTok and Maybe a lot like Instagram. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does. It does seem a little bit like that. Now, um, I, you know, every company works on something for a period of time before it ends up being released. Do we have any idea if this is something that TikTok just came up with out of the blue? Is it something that the company has been working on for a long time? Uh, any hints as to how long TikTok has been working on this? I mean, the fact that it's a all new app and not just, you know, a set of features within TikTok, I think would suggest, 
you know, they've probably been working on this for a while. Um, we know that earlier this month, uh, some users started to get notifications about this mysterious thing called TikTok notes. And, you know, it wasn't really clear, um, you know, exactly what it was when it was something about photo sharing. I know some reverse engineers started seeing, you know, little references to it uh, inside the, the TikTok app's code. So, you know, we started seeing clues earlier this month. Understood. Sure. Understood. Now, the the tech press does largely seem to see this app, TikTok Notes, as a potential Instagram competitor. I was curious to hear your thoughts on that comparison specifically. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because we're so used to seeing uh, Meta and, and Instagram kind of copy their competitors. You know, they spent a lot of the last few years uh, competing with TikTok, you know, Reels, and they add a lot of... Um, effects and, and editing tools that are, you know, clearly trying to play on things that are popular on TikTok. Um, you know, on the other hand, I think it kind of makes sense that TikTok might be interested in pursuing something like this. You know, there's certainly a lot of content on TikTok, but most users are kind of consuming that, not creating that. It takes, you know, a lot more work to mm -hmm. create and edit video clips than it does to, to post photos. So, you know, to me, it makes sense why they would maybe want to see if they can have another app that's maybe um, a little bit easier to to make content and, and share it. Yeah. And, you know, you uh, actually mentioned in your piece a couple of reasons why TikTok could be looking to take on the likes of Instagram. Um, that's where I think it's worth bringing up the potential ban of TikTok in the U.S. and whether or not you uh, you, you've, you know, learned or believe that this does play some role in the introduction of TikTok notes. Would this still be able to exist in a world where TikTok, the video app is banned? I mean, it's hard not to, uh, you know, kind of have that at the front of your mind when you're looking at this, you know, the, the bills looks like it's going to be, you know, moving ahead to the Senate pretty soon. You know, I have to imagine that, you know, TikTok's getting pretty nervous at this point about <laughs> what's going to happen. Um, in any case, it doesn't seem like the, you know, TikTok's going to go away anytime soon. You know, there'd be a legal fight and all that. Um, at the same time, you know, I think you could look at this sort of cynically and say, well, you know, maybe TikTok would have this legal fight, but if they have this kind of other TikTok branded service that links to your account and you can find your followers and, you know, still have some engagement that, you know, maybe that's, you know, I don't want to call it a backup plan, <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, another path for them to still kind of keep an audience engaged um, in this country if it came down to it. Absolutely. Uh, and then secondly, there's the kind of disenchantment that you talk about among Instagram users. Is that a potential opportunity for TikTok? Can you tell us about what Instagram users are upset about and how that could be good for TikTok in the end. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, and I think a lot of this goes back to how much, how many, how much resources um, Meta has put into competing with TikTok and making Instagram, you know, feel a lot more video centric in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but when, you know, 10 years ago when, when Instagram was new, you know, everybody scrolled their feed and it was about sharing on your grid of photos and Instagram's leadership has said, you know, a lot of people don't, don't share out to their feed that much anymore. They're sharing reels, they're sharing in DMs, they're posting stories. And so they've kind of, the product experience sort of reflects that, you know, and you know, that a lot of longtime creators have been pretty upset by this recently. Um, you know, this has been like a long, long time kind of frustration, I think, for them. But they say, you know, hey, I post to my feed. I have thousands of followers. I've built up this audience over years and years. And when I look at my statistics, you know, only a small percentage of my followers are actually seeing my posts. You know, their reach has gone down. Even people like uh, Chrissy Teigen, you know, who's, you know, one of the biggest celebrities on Instagram for a while, uh, posted recently that, you know, nobody sees her posts anymore. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they're kind of, and, you know, Instagram's executives, Adam Mosseri, he goes out there and he tries to explain, you know, how the algorithm works and people just aren't spending as much time on their feed anymore and they're sharing in other ways and, you know, all these explanations. But there's a lot of creators who are like pretty upset by this. They feel like, you know, they've kind of 
been betrayed. So that could be a potential opportunity for somebody like TikTok to come in and make a different experience. If it is, you know, going to be kind of feed and, and photo focused, you know, maybe there is a, an opportunity for them there. Interesting. That is interesting. Now, the app as it stands is currently uh, only available for use in Australia and Canada. Um, is this common practice to release an app in certain markets? And then any word on when or if the app makes its way to the U.S.? Yeah, we see this a lot from companies. Um, you know, again, Meta will often take a similar approach. They'll release something first in, you know, Australia or New Zealand or Canada or something like that. Um, and what I've heard, you know, over the years is that, you know, those are good places for them to test because they're English speaking markets, mm. um, you know, but they're relatively small. They're a lot smaller than the U.S. Um, so it's a good place to kind of, you know, work out some early bugs, see what the response is like. Um, you know, also not a lot of tech press based in those places. So, you know, um, potentially, uh, you know, avoid scrutiny if there's any like initial hiccups, uh, bugs, things like that. Uh, you know, but I think the fact that they are starting in those markets, you know, especially North America and Canada, I think seems pretty likely we would, you know, see it come to the U.S. Um, sooner or later. Understood. Um well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk about TikTok notes uh, for folks who are longtime TikTok users. Maybe they'll be excited that they can whew, take a breather and stop all those TikTok dances they've been doing. <laughs> they can just uh, have some photos for for a time at least. Uh, of course, folks can head over to Engadget.com to check out the work that you do. Is there anywhere else uh, they can go to follow along with what you're doing and stay up to date? Yeah, you know, I'm posting mostly on threads, posting mostly on threads these days, uh, Carissa BE, but I'm still on X and also on Blue Sky, the same username. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your time. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you again soon. Thanks. All righty, folks. Up next, I've got another interview. But before that, I do want to take a quick break here to tell you about something that many of you know and love and that I hope many more of you will come to know and love. <laughs> it's Club Twit at twit.tv slash club twit. Uh, for $7 a month, you can join the club. Again, uh, it's at twit.tv slash club twit. When you join the club, you're going to get access to some awesome, awesome benefits. First and foremost, you get access to every single Twitch show with no ads. It's just the content. So you will be able to listen to the show uh, all the way through without any interruptions because you are supporting us directly. You also gain access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has access to many uh, a video or uh, audio clip. These are uh, this is bonus content that you won't find anywhere else. Behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special Club Twit events get published there. Uh, I still want to mention that we in the past uh, did a an escape room. And that was a lot of fun, and it's only available to those who have that Twit Plus bonus feed. So to be able to watch us try to uh, do an escape room, it was actually an escape room in a box, so we were able to do it here at the studio. And many of us were dressed up in costume because it was around Halloween. Uh, so when you join the club, you get access to this huge back catalog of great stuff that you can't get anywhere else. We also have access to the members-only Discord server, a fun place to go to chat with your fellow club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit, along with sharing animated images uh, and, you know, just all around a great community for conversation. Uh, so, you know, if you... If you're feeling lonely, you might consider joining to join that Discord and have some folks you can chat with and also tune in to live streams that are only available to our uh, Club Twit members. On top of that, if that wasn't enough for you, you also gain access to the video versions of our Club Twit shows. So the Untitled Linux show, Hands on Mac, iOS Today, Hands on Windows, Home Theater Geeks, all of those are... Uh, released to the public as audio. But if you want the video versions of those shows, which for many of them I feel are the best versions of them, you should join the club, twit.tv slash club twit. So please consider uh, heading there today and signing up uh, to be a member of Club Twit. And we appreciate each and every one of you for even considering doing that. 
And we appreciate you even more for when you do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, uh, look for that at twit.tv slash club twit. Thank you so much. And let us go to our last interview for today. This from Lisa Edachico of CNET, who joins us to finally help me understand a question I've been asking. What the heck are super apps? We'll get to that in just a moment. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, it's so great to get you here. I was looking through the World Wide Web the other day, <laughs> and I uh, came across your story, and I said, oh, there's somebody who knows that I need this question <laughs> answered. Absolutely. There's been a lot of talk about super apps lately, but you know, I like I can do context clues and kind of maybe think about what they are. But I don't know. Before we actually do answer the question of what super apps are, why the heck are people talking about super apps in the first place? Yeah, so super apps have come up in the news lately for a couple of reasons. I think the biggest reason recently is the Justice Department's antitrust lawsuit against Apple. Super apps is one of the areas that they kind of targeted in that lawsuit, and they've accused Apple of hampering the development of super apps in the U.S. So that's kind of what prompted me to write this story, because I imagined a lot of people had the question that you had, because super apps aren't really common in the U.S. So I think that's the big reason why people are talking about them now. But also over the past year, there's been chatter about Elon Musk kind of having this vision for the future of X to also become a super app. He calls it an everything app. He's posted that publicly on X. But there's also a report from The Verge last year talking about the details of a, a meeting that happened at the company kind of talking about that vision. So it has come up a few times recently. Understood. So, yeah, let's let's get into it. What are super apps? And then can you tell us about some of the kind of big examples of these feature packed Frankensteinian creations? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So a super app is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's an app, um, an everything app, essentially, that has a lot of mini apps packed into it. So you can kind of think of it almost as its own little app ecosystem. It's one app that you open to do a bunch of different things like buying movie tickets, booking an Uber, messaging your friends, video chatting with your friends, sharing photos. So it kind of combines the elements of social messaging and, and chatting with um, financial services. So that's why why you're able to, to buy things in these apps. Um, so one of the biggest examples, in fact, the biggest example of a successful super app is WeChat, which is really, really popular in China. Um, there's a story that I link to in my story from uh, Bloomberg Business Week um, that kind of details how WeChat has been useful for everyday life in China. And I think that story really kind of illustrates um, how important that app has been in day-to-day -day life. But yes, it's basically an app that does everything. And WeChat, might be the biggest example, but it's certainly not the only one. There's also Alipay, which is really big, and then other apps as well that are popular in other parts of Asia and India. Understood. Now, I wanted to, I think this might be something that comes up for people. And uh, so it may seem obvious on the front of it, but I thought it'd be worth broaching. Um, when we look at super apps, and it's this idea that kind of it's an ecosystem that exists that has access to a bunch of different features and in some cases apps, it started to make me think of something else. How does this compare to that walled garden approach that we talk about when it comes to Apple, where the various services are touted for being designed and engineered to work seamlessly together? Is the iPhone itself kind of a super app or is that a wrong way of thinking about it? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question because I do think with the iPhone, Apple is trying to accomplish a, a really similar goal as, um, you know, these super apps like WeChat. Like you mentioned, yes, a super app is an app, so everything's kind of happening in that contained app. But the iPhone, you know, the underlying goal here is to use your phone for everything in your day to day life, whether it's something happening on your phone or outside of your phone. So, the you know, if you look at the trajectory that Apple has taken with the iPhone, it really is moving in that direction. And I think one of the biggest examples of that came with the Apple card when that was announced years ago. I mean, what's more, um, co what connects your iPhone more to the real world than turning it into your credit card, right? And that's exactly what Apple did with the Apple card. And there's been other small developments along the way that kind of move in that direction. Um, 
For example, you know, having being able to use your iPhone for mass transit, as I do all the time now, uh, I use my iPhone as my Metro card, but also Apple has made some steps to kind of make your iPhone function better as a key for your hotel room, your car, your front door. So I think even though it's executed very differently, it's that same idea of using your phone to do everything in your daily life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really kind of enamored of this idea of an app that does more than just one basic task because bouncing between mm -hmm. the different apps can get a little confusing. So super apps seem kind of cool, but there maybe are some downsides and you bring up a few of those downsides or maybe just, you know, potential issues with an all-in-one app, particularly it seems in countries outside of the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about where uh, critics of super apps kind of say, maybe not a great idea? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the specific points I mentioned in my article are, are kind of, I think, region specific. There's been reports that have come out in recent years about WeChat in particular being used as a surveillance tool. But beyond that, when you think about something that you rely on so much, I think one of the big downsides is just over-reliance, right? Like, God forbid your account gets hacked or something like that, or if the service goes down and there's an outage for some reason. If you're relying on this one app to literally do everything, then you're going to be in, in a tough position. So I think that's probably one of the biggest downsides is, of course, over-reliance on a technology like this. But it also does make you think about, you know, if you are relying on one app so much, it, it probably does become a bigger target for um, cyber attacks and things like that, I would imagine. Absolutely. Now, lastly, I guess I have to point out something that is very clear, which is that super apps don't seem to be super common in the U.S., if you'll forgive the pun. Um, why, why do we think that is? And do you think that we will eventually see super apps come to the U.S., including by way of X, apparently, if that sticks around long enough for it to become a super app? <laughs> Yeah, so I think a lot of it has to do just with the way technology is adopted in the U.S., and I think mobile payments are a really good point of comparison. Mobile payments took off much, much more quickly in Asia than they did and other parts of the world than they did in the U.S. I don't know about you guys, but anecdotally, I think I only really started using my iPhone as my primarily means my primary means of paying for things like paying for the subway and such, probably in like maybe the last two to five years. Mm -hmm. And I think in other parts of the world, adoption has been much, much more quick. And like I mentioned earlier, financial services and digital payments are a big part of what makes a super app a super app. So I think I would imagine that growth kind of goes hand in hand. And as for whether I think they will take off in the US, I do think it's hard to say because we do have companies like Apple and, you know, Alphabet's Google that just have such a big mobile presence. So I think a lot of it depends on the direction that they take the market in. Uh, but that said, some of the reports that I saw when I was writing the story do indicate that super apps are going to grow. I think it was Deloitte that said, um, you know, super apps are going to start to kind of pick up in the U.S. or in Western markets in 2025. So I do think it's, it's a possibility. And we have seen attempts to do that. I mentioned you know, almost a decade ago now, um, Meta, then Facebook, opened up Facebook Messenger to third-party apps. And that was definitely an attempt to kind of make a super app here. We also saw Apple open up iMessage to other apps. And then there's Uber, of course, which kind of operates on that same model of using one app to do multiple things. So uh, I think it, it's certainly a possibility, but it'll likely take some time. Understood. Well, I want to thank you again for taking the time to answer something that's been on my mind ever since I first saw the conversation surrounding super apps. Mm -hmm. um, of course, folks can head to CNET.com to check out your work. But if they want to follow along with you specifically, are there places they can go to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on X and Threads at Lisa Edichico. So it's just at and then my first name and last name. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we'll get to have you back on in the future. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. All righty, folks. With that, we have reached the end of this episode of You Can Believe It of Tech News Weekly. The show publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. You just head there to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. Uh, tell your friends about Tech News Weekly. Tell your family about Tech News Weekly. Uh, we have continued to shape and you know, make the show into what it is today. And I think it 
deserves to be in front of more eyes and ears. So please head to twit.tv slash TNW for those links. Uh, I won't go into super detail about Club Twit because I talked about it during the show, but twit.tv slash Club Twit is where you go. $7 a month uh, to sign up. And if you'd like to follow me online, I'm at Micah Sargent on many a social media network where you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I. H-U-A, H-U-A dot coffee. Uh, That is the website where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Thank you so much for tuning in today for Tech News Weekly. And I should mention that next week, you, you all will be joined by a special guest host. It's Jason Howell who will be with us next week, who will be with you all next week as I will be out. So uh, stay tuned for that. Very exciting that uh, Jason has agreed to join the show as a guest co-host next week in my place. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all for tuning in. And I will see you again in two weeks time. Bye-bye.